Okay, so I'd like to thank Irfan for the, the generous invitation to come here today and also to, to congratulate him and the others here at Berkeley on the start of this wonderful new uh, Center for Quantum Science here at Berkeley. Um, and it, it's really great to be part of the, the festivities today, honoring the work of, of John Clark. Um, so I, I was fortunate to, to be a postdoc with John uh, starting back in, in 2000. Um, but I also I already knew a lot, quite a lot about, about John's work before I came here, uh, since I was a graduate student at University of Illinois uh, with Dale Van Harlingen, who himself had been a postdoc with John uh, some time before that. Uh, so, so Dale was always telling me about all the great work going on in John's group, uh, and he held up John, John's work uh, in terms of tackling uh, you know, very hard experimental problems with, with a very uh, careful, meticulous attention to detail as, as the real ideal. Um, so besides John's uh, great reputation as, as a world-class uh, research scientist, uh, when I was here as a postdoc, I gained a, a, a real appreciation for his, his uh, really excellent teaching abilities, too. Um, I, I filled in for John teaching his classes uh, on many occasions when he, when he traveled. Um, and uh, he, he always had uh, incredible notes, very detailed. And it was clear that he really put a lot of time and effort in, into teaching his classes. Uh, and he really cared quite a bit about, about his students learning, uh, learning science. Um, so I'm going to uh, start out today saying just a little bit about, uh, maybe a little more than a little bit, medium bit, bit how about, uh, about what I worked on with John and his group uh, in the early days of, of, of superconducting qubits here at Berkeley. And then I'll go on to talk about some, some very recent work in my group at, at Syracuse uh, with, with a connection to, to, to John's uh, work over the years on, in terms of uh, flux noise. In this case, we're working on making a, a, trying to make a qubit that, that's uh, less sensitive to flux noise, that can still remain, remain coherent. Okay, so just first some, some quick acknowledgments. Uh, the work in my lab at Syracuse uh, is primarily the work of, of, a, of a postdoc, uh, Matthew Hutchings, in my group uh, right now, uh, who, who did a lot of careful measurements and fabrication. Uh, and, and much of what we do in my group is, is made possible by, by the fact that we're about an hour away from a really great uh, clean room uh, facility down at Cornell, uh, down at Ithaca. And then uh, this, this particular work is also a part of a close collaboration with IBM, uh, where they, they've also been doing some parallel measurements on, on some similar devices that I'll talk about uh, a little bit later, a uh, little, little bit later in my talk. Okay, so. I came to, to Berkeley in, in 2000, uh, joined John's group then, and I, I was here through uh, until the end of 2004, so just about 12 years ago, maybe 12 years and a week ago when I moved to, to Syracuse. This was a very t exciting time. Right? So, so the, some of the, the uh, as, as we've heard already in a, in a few talks now, kind of going over the history of, of supernecting qubits, uh, some of the very first measurements of, of coherent oscillations in a, in a qubit were done just a year before that, right, at, at NEC in 1999. Um, and so lots was happening. It was, it was a really, really, uh, really busy, exciting time in the field. Uh, and it was within a few months of when I came to, to Berkeley, uh, when the, the paper from, from Hans Moyes Group in Delft came out, uh, showing uh, these uh, spectroscopic evidence for, for superpositions of, of states and, and flux qubits. So uh, we, we had some really stiff competition, too. There, there was a lot to, we had to get going, uh, and quickly. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, was, I was able to work with, uh, in addition to John, uh, a great team of, of graduate students uh, and, and visitors. Uh, one of these, Tim Robertson, was, was around uh, yesterday. It was great to see him. I hadn't seen him in many years. I'm not sure if he's out there today. Um, uh, but, and this is a, a picture of, of, of many of us, uh, some of the qubit people, but some of the other people representing the many other uh, squid-related things going on in John's group at the time. This, I think, was actually uh, Sh Sherry Cho provided the, the, uh, the picture for me. This was uh, from my farewell party when I left uh, Berkeley. Um, so when I got here, we had to really get started quickly. Uh, there was a, a part of, of one of John's labs in the basement of Burge Hall. We had to reconfigure. We had to, to set up a new shielded room, set up a new dilution fridge, get it wired up, get a, a qubit fabrication process on the air. Uh, but we, we did these things. Um, and you know, one of the things we were working on was trying to make, make flux qubits. And we were interested in trying to, to develop us one of the early techniques for, for doing on-ship flux biasing. And we were interested in trying to be able to, to work out a scheme for doing independent flux biasing so we could set the, the flux bias for the qubit independently from the flux bias for the, the readout squid that we were using to, to measure the qubit. Um, this was uh, a measurement of, of the spectroscopic, uh, the flux dependence of, of the energy levels for, for one of these flux qubits. And this is a, a measurement then of, of some coherent oscillations, in this case a, a Ramsey interference uh, measurement of, of uh, 
of one of these flux qubits. And note that the time scale here for the, the spacing between the, the pi over two pulses, the, these Ramsey fringes, it was great to see them. We were very excited, but they're decaying after over you know, a few nano, nanoseconds, or at, at best 10 nanoseconds. So we'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. Uh, Okay, something else we, we worked on was, was sort of the readout end of things. Uh, were there ways we could try to improve the, the, the ability to read out uh, the state of a supernecting flux qubit? And so uh, back in, the, in those days, we and, and other groups, uh, the, the way we would read these out was with the, with the DC squid. And this was with a, an unshunted DC squid. So you would detect a switching out into the voltage state. And that would be a flux dependent process. So depending on if the, if the qubit was spinning up or spinning down, that would affect the, the switching current where you would, would have this, this uh, switching out to the voltage state of the squid. Now that, that, that switching process is, is stochastic and there's some, some width to that, that switching distribution. So we were interested in trying to come up with ways to, to narrow that, that distribution to give us greater sensitivity. And one way you can go about doing that is, is adding in some damping. Um, so say putting a resistor across the, the, the junctions uh, but that wouldn't be such a good idea if you've got a qubit nearby, because the, the Nyquist noise from those, those, resist, the, those resistors are quickly going to, to mess up the qubit and, and, and just generally cause problems. So we came up with a scheme for frequency-dependent damping, where we would uh, shunt each junction with an RC shunt, so that you'd get damping up at the high frequencies, up at the plasma frequency of the squid, where you need to, to damp its, its oscillations to, to narrow those distributions. But the, the capacitors, the impedance of those capacitors would block the Nyquist currents uh, coming from these shunt resistors at the much order of magnitude or so lower frequencies of the qubit. And so we, we measured the, uh, these, these sorts of RC shunted squids and showed that in fact the, the RC shunts did their job and, and they damped uh, the, the, the squid and, and narrowed the, the switching distributions. Okay, uh, about a year after I got here, I was fortunate to have my PhD advisor, Dale Van Harlingen, come out here to Berkeley and, and uh, join me and, and John and the others in the group uh, while he was on sabbatical. So this was a really great time. Uh, it was an exciting time for, for Dale to come out and it was, it was great to, to work with him again. And one of the problems we, we worked on together, and Dale already showed a slide about this today, so I, um, but was uh, worrying about issues of, of low frequency noise, in this case, low frequency noise uh, in critical current fluctuations in the junctions that make up the qubits. So this was, it was, it was known for some time that, that Joseon junctions have these, these fluctuations in their critical current coming from, from microscopic dynamics in the tunnel barriers. And uh, the question was, how, how would this uh, low frequency noise impact uh, dephasing in, in the, in the superacting qubits. Because of course, if, if there are fluctuations in the critical current, that translates into fluctuations in the Josephson energy, which then corresponds to fluctuations in the qubit energy. So this parametric variation uh, in, in the qubit energy splitting is going to cause some, some phase wandering and cause a, a superposition to, to, uh, wrap, to, to dephase. Okay, so we, we went through and we, we studied that. Uh, and then sort of in my last year or so at, at Berkeley, we worked on a scheme uh, to, to come up with a way, if, if we've got two flux qubits, to have a way to try to control uh, the interaction between them. So to actually try to have some, uh, some kind of controllable coupling. And the scheme that we came up with was based on using the, the dynamic inductance of the same DC squid that we had uh, wrapped around the two qubits uh, to measure them in the first place. So this is a picture of one of these devices. Here's one of the flux qubits. Here's another one. And then the DC squid wraps all the way around them with its junctions here and here, and it's got current leads coming out the top and the bottom of it. And so by changing that current through it, we can change its dynamic inductance, and that uh, effectively changes the, the coupling uh, between the two, two, uh, two qubits. This is a picture of the spectroscopy then of this two qubit system. You can see the two characteristic hyperbolas of a flux, flux qubit uh, here, for one of them and here for the other, and they appear to cross up here at this, this point up near a little bit above 11 gigahertz. But if you zoom in, you can see, of course, that there's an anti-crossing. So we get this, this little gap, and that comes about because of the coupling. There's a natural coupling between the two flux qubits just from their mutual inductance from being near each other. But there's also a component that comes from the, the coupling of each qubit to the squid, and that's the part that we can control. And we showed that then by uh, changing the bias current through the squid, we're able to tune the size of this, this splitting and bring it all the way to zero and actually have it pop out on the other side, uh, presumably with the opposite sign, although we couldn't actually confirm from, from the measurements that it, that it actually changed sign. From, that would be from anti-ferromagnetic to ferromagnetic. But this was, was one of the first demonstrations then of, of controllable coupling uh, in, in between two qubits in, in the solid state. Okay, so that was 
Uh, that was when I was at Berkeley. And this, this experiment actually, is the, we, we started it before I left. And, and uh, the bulk of the measurements were done by two of the graduate students in the, the year after I left, my, my first year at Syracuse, um, with a lot of time on the phone and, and traveling back and forth. Um, but flat, let's fast forward 10 or 12 years now. Um, and as we've heard in, in several talks and uh, in some talks yesterday, too, um, superconducting qubits have, have advanced quite a bit uh, since since back in, in 1999. And this is a plot uh, that has already appeared now in, in a few talks that was from a paper from, from Rob and Michelle uh, from a few years back, showing that this really impressive trajectory of the advance in, in, in qubit coherence times over the last uh, 16 or 17 years or so. And so we're now up here pushing 100 microseconds um, for these, these kinds of coherent times. And so this has really led to, to these circuits being really promising uh, for building a large architecture, uh, for, for making a quantum computer, uh, and also for many other uh, potential applications, like in quantum simulation, and just generally exploring cool things with, with quantum optics in the microwave regime. And so I just highlight here two, two recent uh, experiments showing sort of the, 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 the progression in scaling to larger and larger structures of qubits. Uh, some work from a year or two ago uh, at UCSB and Google with, with a nine qubit system where they implemented some, some initial stages of, of quantum error correction and an even more recent experiment from just a few months, uh, published at least just a few months back from, from my collaborators uh, at IBM uh, with a, a seven qubit system where they were measuring uh, multi-qubit qubit parity between, between four different qubits in that, that lattice. So of course, we'd like to have even, even more coherence. We never, never want to stop. We want to keep making qubits better and better. Uh, but if, if we want to, to really scale to even larger structures than this, you know, go, go beyond 10 or 100 or, or however far up you want to go, um, there, there are other issues that come into play with that, that scalability. Um, one of them is, is frequency crowding. And I'll have a slide on this uh, coming up in, in, in a, few, uh, a few slides. Um, and to, one way around that is to, is to make the qubits tunable. If you can have some way to adjust the qubit frequencies at least a little bit, um, then you, you can help to alleviate these sorts of frequency crowding problems. Um, but the, it doesn't come without, without a potential price. And that price is once you make the qubits tunable, uh, you open them up to, to being sensitive to noise and whatever that tuning variable is. Uh, and, and the common way to do this with superconducting qubits is, is tuning with a magnetic flux. And so we, we've already heard uh, in, in excellent talks earlier today, that, that magnetic flux noise is a big issue in superconducting circuits at, at low temperatures. Um, so let me just say a little bit about the, the qubits themselves. Uh, and this probably is uh, not new to anybody here, but let me just uh, make sure we're all on the same page. So the, the qubit we're going to be focusing on uh, is, is the transmon qubit, which was pioneered at, at, at Yale uh, and described in this, this really seminal, uh, excellent work here uh, back from 2007. And so the qubit at, at its heart is really just an LC oscillator, um, where the L is, is a Josephson junction. So it, it provides us with this great nonlinearity where it's, it's, its inductance uh, depends on how much current is, is going through it. And uh, these, uh, these transmine qubits then have just the right balance of the energy of the qubit between the Josephson element and the capacitive element. And that's really driven a lot of that, the, the rapid progress in this plot I showed on, on the previous slide from, from Rob and Michelle. Um, and the transmons are also naturally suited for then coupling uh, to microwave cavities, uh, something else that was really pioneered at, at, at Yale, uh, the, the whole field of, of circuit quantum electrodynamics, and coupling uh, transmons then in these either planar cavities or, or three-dimensional uh, transmission uh, waveguide cavities. Okay, and you know, what, what limits the performance of these things? What's, what sets the decoherence? And of course, we can break this into to do two categories. Uh, there's sort of T1 types of things that give us relaxation of the qubit from an excited state uh, back down to, to a ground state. And there, there, I listed a couple things here. Probably the, the biggest one nowadays is, is dielectric loss. Um, and there's, there's still work to be done in, in, in that area to try to beat that down further, or at least or make the qubits less sensitive to it so that you can have even longer T1s. Um, there are other things that come into play, including uh, non-equilibrium quasi-particles, trapped vortices, both things that I've, I've been working on uh, over the past several years, but I'm not going to talk about those today. On the other side, uh, besides uh, T1 types of processes, we have to worry about dephasing. Uh, so T2, T2 star types of processes. So these are things that tend to, uh, to cause a, a superposition uh, to, the, uh, to, to its, its phase coherence to decay over time. And this can come from, from a variety of sources. Uh, 
possibly the critical current noise that we worried about when, when uh, Dale and I were both here at Berkeley, uh, although it's not clear right now that's, that's playing much of a role. Um, but uh, one issue is, is, is fluctuations of, of, of the photon occupation in the readout cavity. This can cause dephasing. Uh, but the big one we'll focus on today, and that we've already heard a lot about today, is, is magnetic flux noise, uh, at least if you have a, have a tunable qubit. Okay. And so let, let me say something I, I mentioned briefly before about the idea of frequency crowding in, in larger qubit architectures. And this is a slide uh, that was mostly prepared by, by my collaborators, by, by uh, Jared Hertzberg at, at IBM. And this summarizes some, some of their analysis of, of the frequency crowding problem. Um, the IBM scheme for, for the past several years for, for making uh, large qubit architectures has involved uh, working with fixed frequency qubits. So qubits that where it's, it's really just that simple LC oscillator I showed, where the L is just one Josephson junction, uh, but you can't tune it. So it's, it's, its frequency is, is, its transition frequency is fixed once you fabricate the junction. Once you determine what the junction area is and what the critical current density is, that, that uh, tells you what the qubit frequency is going to be. And there are two qubit gates, which of course you need for any type of quantum computing architecture, are done with something called the cross-resonance gate which is, has, has some very nice properties. It, it's an all microwave gate. Uh, it involves, if you have two qubits coupled to a common bus, so, so a, a microwave cavity, you drive one of the qubits at the frequency of the other qubit, and it turns on it tur uh, a two qubit interaction that can lead to entanglement. Uh, but for this gate to work well, there's sort of a, a relatively small window of detuning between the two qubits. Uh, you don't want them to be right on top of each other. The gate really doesn't work there. Uh, and you don't want to be, them to be too far apart. And you also don't want them to be at, at a particularly bad point, like say have a qubits, one of the qubits 1, 2 transition matching with the 0, 1 transition of the other qubit. So there's kind of some windows you have to, have to sit in. And uh, if you could dial in qubit frequencies perfectly right off the bat with the fabrication, then that would be great and, and everything would be, would be super. Um, but uh, we all know that that's uh, not exactly the case. Once you, you make a, a bunch of qubits, you try to make them identically the same, it's not even just qubits, any, any Josephson junctions, uh, there's going to be some spread in, in the critical currents that you get. And this was some analysis uh, they did at IBM on about, uh, yeah, okay, 40 different qubits that they had measured where they, they had tried to make them nominally identical, so aiming for the same areas, the same uh, capacitors, the same critical current density and everything, and here's the spread in qubit frequencies that, that they got. It's, it has a width of about 230 megahertz or so, um, so they can target a, a decent window, but it's, it's going to have some fuzz to it. And so if, if you go about and you try to make your lattice then of fixed frequency qubits with this kind of spread, well, if you're trying to make, say, about seven qubits, um, you're going to have some of the time, you're going to have a couple uh, gate pairs where pairs of the qubits are going to end up in these bad windows where these two qubit gates just don't work. This was, a, a, I believe, a Monte Carlo simulation that, that Jared Hertzberg and Jay Gambetta did together, uh, throwing in this type of spread for the, the, the qubit frequencies and figuring out when you would end up with, with bad pairs of qubits. Um, so maybe that doesn't sound too bad, but if you go to 17 qubits, which is the current target to try to make a, a logical qubit, you end up with a bunch more, okay, up about eight pairs that aren't going to work. You try to go up to 49, it gets even worse. You're up near 30. Uh, so this, this clearly is going to break down at some point. And, and you, there's going to either need to be some rapid, uh, significant improvement in this to narrow that width to be able to target particular frequencies, or you're going to have to come up with a way to, to make the qubits uh, tunable. And as I mentioned before, the, the, the pen, potential penalty there is making the qubits now sensitive to magnetic flux noise, which I don't really need to spend too much time on this slide because we already had two, uh, two very nice talks earlier uh, before lunch. Uh, but this was, of course, discovered uh, about 30 years ago here at Berkeley uh, that at low temperatures, superconducting circuits tend to have this, this uh, nearly ubiquitous uh, 1 over F noise, or n roughly 1 over F noise, uh, that is close to independent of, of geometry and materials and, and all sorts of things. Uh, but then uh, Robert McDermott and, and his, his team at Wisconsin have, have done a, a series of ele very elegant experiments uh, that have identified uh, the source of this noise and now figured out ways to, to, uh, potent to, to reduce it uh, but by improving the vacuum condition to, to reduce the amount of oxygen that's on the surface uh, when the device is cooled. Okay. So, let me talk a little bit about, about qubit tuning. Um, so, of course, typical ways that, that these transmons are made, if you do want to be able to tune it, is rather than a, a single junction, you make that junction two junctions arranged in a, in a DC squid loop. And so now if you tune the flux in that loop, that changes the Josephson energy 
across here. And that, that therefore tunes the, the qubit frequency from a maximum up here with, with zero slope. So this would be what's called a, a flux insensitive sweet spot down, all the way down to zero at the half integer flux quantum points. And now if, if you uh, don't necessarily need to tune over this whole range, say from five or six gigahertz all the way down to zero, uh, say in, in the case of the IBM architecture, you really only need to be able to tune over a few hundred megahertz. And you can actually make a qubit that can do that if you make the two junctions asymmetric. If you make one of the junctions much smaller than the other, now you remove this divergence of the Josephson inductance at the half integer flux quantum points, and you bring this zero point up, and now you have a, a lower flux insensitive sweet spot also. And depending on how asymmetric you make it, the, the more asymmetric you make the qubit, the smaller this, this tuning window becomes. And we first started looking at these, these types of qubits, these asymmetric transmons, uh, a, while, a few years back in my group at, at Syracuse, where we were looking at, at uh, s some frequency modulated uh, qubit cavity sidebands, where the, the asymmetric transmon turned out to be a great fit for those experiments. OK, so we've been studying these in, uh, in my group now uh, for a little while, trying to, to study the, their coherence. And this is a, a, a chip uh, we, we measured, fabricated and measured uh, not so long ago with eight of these uh, asymmetric transmons on it. So eight along here. Each one has its own readout cavity, and they're all multiplexed to a, to a common feed line. Uh, but what we can do is we, we can make the, these qubits with different levels of asymmetry. So we can try to study how they're, they're dephasing uh, depends on the, this, basically the gradient of, of their energy bands. And so we, we went with, um, actually, there's two copies each of four different kinds of qubits. Uh, one of them is just a, a single junction untunable qubit to give us kind of a baseline for what the dephasing is like. Uh, then we have two symmetric qubits that are fully tunable. We have two that are somewhat asymmetric, a four to one ratio, and two that have a, a pretty large asymmetry, a seven to one. Okay. And so this is a, a picture of the spectroscopy. So of course, the, the fixed one doesn't tune. It's flat. Um, the symmetric one tunes very much. We can tune it quite far down. And then the other two asymmetries are here. And so uh, and, we, and we can fit both of these to this, this expression that was worked out back in the original transmon paper from 2007. Um, the performance of these qubits is pretty good. It's, it's maybe not the, the absolute best, but we're, you know, we're reasonably happy with it. We're up in the teens to 20 microseconds here for T1 up at high frequencies, and that increases as you go tune down lower, uh, which other groups have seen, uh, consistent with, with dielectric loss. So it can be up around 40 or even 50 microseconds if we tune down to four and a half or five, five gigahertz or so. Okay. Um, now we can look at the coherence. We can measure Ramsey fringes, and we're going to focus on, on Ramsey fringes uh, for, for this work. And this is looking at the, the fixed frequency qubit. We do a Ramsey fringe, and we get a T2 star time up here around eight or so microseconds. And if we operate the one-to-one -one qubit, the, the symmetric one that tunes the most, uh, at its, its sweet spot, we get about the same uh, T2 star time. But as we tune off the sweet spot, you can see the Ramsey fringes decay a whole lot more quickly. And this T2 star time falls off very, very rapidly and gets down to a microsecond or two when, you, when, you're, when you're out here. OK, it gets a little messy if we throw on the other qubits. But if, if we look at, say, the, the 4 to 1, we can see it tunes down. But then it comes back up when we get to its lower sweet spot over here. Same thing happens with the, the 7 to 1, the more symmetric qubit, although it also is, is shifted up. And that is uh, something that we've seen on, on several chips now, where we have sort of a variation in the, the background dephasing, the, the non-flux uh, dependent dephasing of the qubit, um, which is something we're, we're still working on trying to, to sort out. Um, we can plot this a, a different way. We can plot it instead as, as a rate. It's a little bit easier to visualize. So we can subtract off the T1 contribution here in the usual way. So just plot the dephasing rate. This is for the symmetric qubit uh, at the sweet spot and far away from the sweet spot and, and the fixed frequency qubit. And what we can do is we can take the, the energy band, the fit to the energy band that I showed you a few slides back, and we can just uh, take the derivative of that, and we can multiply by a scale factor, which is in a sense fitting the, the, the flux noise level, plus an offset, which is sort of fitting the, the background dephasing level, and we can get a pretty good fit to the data. And we can do the same thing uh, for the, the other two qubits on the chip, the, the four to one qubit and the seven to one qubit, and we can use the same scale factor for all three of them and get, get curves that go nicely through, uh, through all, all the sets of data, which is telling us, as, as we might have expected, that the, the flux noise level seen by all these qubits is, is basically the, the same across the, across the chip. And we can plot this uh, one different way, in, uh, maybe I think an even more direct way, by directly plotting the dephasing rates versus the gradient of the energy band that we calculate from, from those energy band fits 
and this is a way to try to get the data to collapse on, onto, a, onto a common curve. And they would collapse onto a common curve if they all had the same background dephasing down here, um, where we're at, at the sweet spots, but, but they don't. Again, there's some variation in that. But they do all, you see, plotted on a, on a log log scale. This linear fit uh, basically converges up here, almost converges to, to a straight line. And we can follow the analysis that, that was done uh, in, in the early days of, of looking at, at dephasing due to flux noise in, in uh, superintend qubits from about 10 years ago. Um, th this sorts of relationship, relating the, the dephasing rate to the slope of the energy band and the, the, the strength of, of the flux noise. And we get a level right about here. And I'll just close by showing the, the parallel work of my collaborators at IBM, uh, where they made an extreme asymmetric uh, transmon qubit. In this case, you know, our, our big, most asymmetric one was 7 to 1. Uh, they made a qubit here that's 15 to 1, so 15 times larger junction uh, compared to a really tiny one on the other side of the qubit. And they now have a qubit that tunes over about 340 megahertz, which doesn't sound like much, but that, that's enough. Uh, for, for uh, sort of covering these sorts of frequency spreads you get uh, from just natural fabrication variations. And in this case now, the qubit becomes pretty much independent of, of uh, flux for, for its, its dephasing. So, so T2 star here, okay, it's got some, some wiggles and some, some noise in it, but it's generally flat over, over this whole, whole flux quantum range. And we can put that on, on the same curve, and it comes in right down here. So we've got this, this window down here. If we stay below about a gigahertz per finite or so of gradient, uh, where, where the, the uh, de defacing of the qubit is, is more or less uh, independent of flux. So I'll, I'll uh, put up my conclusions here and say, you know, in, in the future, th there's prospects both for trying to reduce that background defacing. Um, we, we can learn from, from the, the work in Rob's group uh, at Yale on, on how to understand this, this photon shot noise uh, defacing, and we, we uh, are working on coming up with better ways to, to thermalize things, uh, better ways to optimize the coupling of, of the qubit to the cavity, cavity to the output, uh, these things. Uh, but we can also, uh, we're also working with, with Robert McDermott's group to come up with, uh, to uh, try his, his, his great new techniques for uh, improving the, the vacuum conditions that the qubit is cooled in, uh, to try to reduce the flux noise level and sort of beat down both the, the offset and the, and the, the, uh, the slope. And I'll close by just thanking John for being a, a, a truly wonderful mentor uh, and really being an inspiration for, for all my scientific work uh, moving forward. So thanks. Thank you. We, again, have time for questions and discussions. So over there. Hi. Uh, so you mentioned one of the uh, reasons for uh, short coherency length is dielectric loss. So what substrate are you fabricating these on? These are done on silicon. So has there, any, has there been any work to explore other substrates like um, silica or alumina, which have orders of magnitudes lower dielectric loss? Sure. So, so certainly uh, many groups have worked on making qubits on sapphire. Uh, in fact, in, in the 3D qubit work, I think the majority of the work there has been done on, on sapphire. Um, it turns out most of the, the dielectric loss is not so much bulk dielectric loss in the substrate, it's interfacial dielectric loss. Uh, so so we're, uh, we're pretty confident we're not limited by dielectric loss deep in the silicon itself. It's at the interface between the silicon and the niobium or the silicon and the aluminum uh, that's, that's the issue. Okay, thanks. Sure. Do you have? Uh, a hybrid, and it's a nice talk, and uh, the stuff with the asymmetric transmons I like a lot. I was wondering if you guys have looked at other properties of the qubit in this asymmetric design. In the you know, original paper, we sort of said, well, okay, it just acts like one Josephson junction, but that's sort of an approximation. So like, do you find that the anharmonicities or uh, you know, other properties of the qubit make sense or act as just, just there's one uh, effective junction or is there anything more subtle that happens yeah, with so, these Yeah, so I mean, the first devices. question, anharmonicity is, is the same. That's, that's no different from a conventional symmetric transmon. But I, I do have a slide on your sort of the, the main gist of it is, you know, is there anything bad about this? What, is there a penalty you get for building in this asymmetry? And this was something that was in your, your original transmon paper, uh, this issue of, of uh, a potential T1 limit uh, due to coupling to the flux line, so emission into the, the impedance uh, that the qubit is coupled to through the mutual. Uh, and 
so this is the calculation following pretty much what, what's done in your paper. Uh, so here's a mostly symmetric qubit. It's T1 through that mechanism would be seconds at, at, at the sweet spot. It would drop to 30 or so, what is it, 30 or 40 milliseconds there. It gets worse if you, if you make a more asymmetric qubit, but it's not crazy. I mean, it's still 10 or 20 milliseconds. So that, that's you know, a, a potential penalty, but I, I wouldn't worry about it. The other thing to think about is uh, the way we're doing this, the way IBM is doing it right now, it means one of your junctions is really big. I mean, if you want to make this 15 to 1 qubit, we're not making nanoscale junctions for the small ones. So that, that guy is maybe 100 nanometers on a side. So it means your big junction is a lot bigger than people would normally make a transbond junction. So that so far doesn't seem to be a limit. We're still getting good T1s, but potentially that could mean we'd hit some problem from junctions earlier than you would for, for transbonds with smaller junctions. <laughs> 